verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. Your Bible may say band, but that doesn't mean that they were musicians. This was a military unit, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. That would be noontime. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and being let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. They called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? They said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Verse 28, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, four, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour and at the ninth hour, that's three o'clock, it's the Jewish hour of prayer. I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you've done well to come. Now therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did. 
both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, the Jews, who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized, who's, who've received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Now I want to share with you this morning on this topic how to reach people who can't be reached. How to reach people who can't be reached. Let's pray together as we look into the word of the Lord today. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the gift of your word. It's a lamp for our feet and it's a light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Father, we ask you to let our hearts be good soil during this time. Jesus said that his words were spirit and life. So, Father, we ask that you would send the Holy Spirit to minister that life to our hearts now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is a pivotal chapter in the book of Acts, and the story of Cornelius is one of the most important turning points in the 2,000 year history of the church. It's such an important story that in case you had not noticed, the Holy Spirit made it extra long for you and he repeated certain key details in the story. Now, when the Lord gives you a story that's a little bit longer and repeats himself in the story, there's a reason for that and that is to highlight exactly how important a story this is. Now, at this time, some eight to 10 years after the resurrection of Jesus, it still seemed logical that the followers of Jesus might remain just one of several groups inside Judaism. There were Sadducees, there were Pharisees, and now there was a new group, the followers of Jesus, the followers of the way, whom the Jewish believers called Nazarenes. And in fact, if you go to Israel today, you'll find that in Hebrew, Christians are still called Nazarenes today. And it's here in Acts chapter 10 that we see the young faith begin to change from being a Jewish denomination to becoming a worldwide faith that would embrace all nations. Before Acts chapter 10, as strange as it may seem to us nowadays, everyone knew that you had to be Jewish to believe in Jesus. After Acts chapter 10, people began to believe that Jesus was for everybody except Jewish people. This is also one of the last times that we see Peter in a prominent role in the book of Acts, and so it marks a turning point in the book where we begin to move away from the story of the original apostles and start speaking about the ministry of Paul and his co-workers as they reach out to the Roman world. But Acts chapter 10 is not just a lesson about the history of the church. It's a story about the love of God and his heart for people. It's the story of how Peter reached people that he didn't even think God wanted to reach. And it was a group of people who didn't think God wanted them either. It's a story of how God can reach anyone with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I find in this story three things that Peter did, three things that we will need to do also if we want to reach people who can't be reached. How many of you in your own lives, maybe you have a list of some people that you think can't be reached for the Lord? You know some folks like that? Well, let's look together at three ways to reach people who can't be reached. And the first one is this, get rid of your list of unreachable people. Just get rid of your list of unreachable people. The first thing that Peter needed to do was get rid of that list. And at the top of every Jewish person's list of unwanted people 
were the Gentiles. Anyone who was not of the seed of Israel was considered by Jews to be unclean and maybe even a little dangerous. For Jewish people, even Jewish people who believed in Jesus as the Messiah, Gentiles were not wanted. It would probably not even have occurred to Peter to reach out to them with the message of Jesus Christ if he didn't have a vision and an angel. After all, as far as Peter and the other apostles were concerned, Jesus was for Jews. Gentile salvation, the idea that non-Jews could be part of the family of God, was a mystery that was not really well understood before Jesus came. The salvation of Cornelius and the sight of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the friends and family of Cornelius was something that came as a complete shock, a complete surprise to Peter and to the six brothers that he took with him. In verse 45, we read that they were astonished. We would say that they were blown away. They never imagined that such a thing could be possible. You see, the Jews at that time were greatly prejudiced against Gentiles, and the Gentiles returned the favor. Jews did not enter into business dealings with Gentiles when they could help it. Certainly, they did not eat Gentile food. Peter would have hated the breakfast for Bangladesh. Peter had never had any bacon. He never had your uncle Suprazat. My Jamaican friends, he never had any doubles. He never had any of those good things. The law of Moses specified what Jewish people could eat under the laws of kosher. They had a tremendous zeal for those laws, and many of them still do, of course. Even if you were not going to be a Bible scholar, every Jewish male had to memorize those three chapters of Leviticus that told you what you were allowed to eat and what you were not allowed to eat, and you needed to know the difference. In ancient times, some Jewish people had even been martyred for their faith because they refused to eat pork. So in order to avoid the possibility of being contaminated by Gentile food, Jews did not enter the home of a Gentile. It didn't matter how famous Mrs. Cornelius might have been for her meatballs and cannolis. Because Simon Peter, who was still better known as Shimon Kepha, could not run the risk of eating them. If he did, he would probably have considered himself to be impure, unclean, and tarnished under the law of Moses. And of course, Jews did not marry Gentiles. The Roman historian Tacitus tells us that Jews, quote, keep separate from all strangers in eating, sleeping, and matrimonial connections. Now, despite all of this, many people actually wanted to become Jews in the ancient world because Judaism was still an attractive way of life. The teaching of Moses and the lifestyle that resulted from it was far superior to the pagan lifestyle of the Roman Empire. Rome offered the world slavery, infanticide, child prostitution, and degenerate behavior of all kinds. Judaism offered people a strong family life, purity, charity, and education. In the ancient world, it's probably true that almost no women could read except Jewish women. So there were many people like Cornelius in the empire, Gentiles who did honor the God of Israel as the one true God. And these people were known as God-fearers because they gave reverence to the God of Israel. They prayed to Israel's God. But for various reasons, not many perhaps could go all the way and take all the steps that were required in order to actually become Jews themselves. You see, becoming a Jew would mean isolating yourself from all of your friends. Becoming a Jew would mean not being able to share a table, a dinner table, with your own flesh and blood. 
And so for most people, it was simply too high of a hurdle to jump over. In order to reach Gentiles, though, even friendly Gentiles like Cornelius, Peter would need to jump over some major fences of his own. You know, God had used the apostles to open doors that the devil was using to keep people out of his kingdom. You know, Jesus said, right, that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church and he was going to build his church. And Pastor has been sharing with us how the keys of the kingdom were used to unlock Jerusalem and Judea and then Samaria to the kingdom of God by the apostles. But now Peter was coming to the highest gate, to the most difficult wall of all, the wall between the Jew on one side and the Gentile on the other side. It was a wall that nobody wanted to break down on either side of it. To do so, Peter was going to have to ignore thousands of years of tradition, and he was also going to have to put aside his idea of what God, he thought, expected of him. But Peter threw away his list of unreachable people when he saw that God loves all kinds of people. So church, I think we should ask ourselves the question today, who's on our list of unreachable people? We may not ever verbalize it to others, but maybe in the back of our minds, we do have a good list of people whom we think cannot be reached for Jesus. Maybe it's that difficult relative who is stuck in traditional religion and mocks you, calling you a Jesus freak. You know, the one that has to make a scene at every family dinner. Oh, they're here. Hallelujah. You know, you know that guy. Some of you are related to that guy. Maybe it's a friend who's bound by drugs and you're watching them go into a downward spiral of denial and lies and you're wondering how that person can be reached. Maybe it's a rebellious teenager with so many piercings that you're afraid she's going to spring a leak. But church, we need to see today that the category of unreachable people is a category that we invented not a category that God invented. And right here at Harvest Time, thank God we've seen all kinds of supposedly unreachable people transformed by Jesus Christ. Muslims and Hindus and traditional Catholics, drug addicts and homosexuals, people with some really crazy ink and people who have stuck more than just a few holes in themselves. Peter learned that God shows no partiality, that God is more welcoming than we are. God showed Peter that anyone can be acceptable to him. Now, notice I did not say that everyone is accepted already, but anyone can be acceptable because no one's truly accepted until they come through the proper door. Jesus said, I am the door. If any man enters through me, he shall be saved. Jesus says the door is open to any man, so come in and be saved. The Bible says to those who believed in him, even to those who believed in his name, he gave them the power. He gave them the ability to become the sons of God. Church, in order to bring in the harvest of souls that God desires to give us, we're going to have to throw away our list of unreachable people. We need to have faith that God will use us to reach people who don't seem to have a chance. Let's get rid of the idea that it's just no use bringing the gospel to certain people. Three ways to reach people who can't be reached. The first one is get rid of your list of unreachable people. The second one is this, follow the spirit into unfamiliar territory. Follow the Holy Spirit into unfamiliar territory. We need to follow the Spirit of the Lord into new places. At Harvest Time, we've just wrapped up a time of fasting that we've been doing as a congregation, and it was centered around the, the theme or the idea of new territory. But how many of you know that before we can take new territory for God or 
before we can take new territory perhaps in our personal lives, that means that we probably have to take some new territory in our thinking. You know, it's just human nature, isn't it? Most of us have to be dragged, kicking and screaming into the future. We all get set in our ways and we share the mentality perhaps of the man who got frustrated one day and said, new and improved, new and improved. What was everything we had before, old and lousy? Sometimes we feel that way, but you know, God is always stretching us. God is always summoning us and bringing us into new ideas and new things and calling us to think in new ways that perhaps we've never thought in the past. And if you want to reach people who can't be reached, then we will need to follow the Holy Spirit the way Peter did. And the first way to do that is this, go up on your roof and get a vision for a bigger outreach. Go up on your roof and get a vision for a bigger outreach. We read in Acts 10 here that Peter had a vision. And you know what, church? Visions don't change the word of God. I think I better say that again. Peter had a vision, and visions don't change the word of God. However, God can supernaturally help us to see what we might have been missing in the word of God. And Peter had missed the fact that God had made many wonderful promises, dozens of them in fact, to save people who were not Jewish. It's woven like a thread through the Psalms, through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. God had given many wonderful indications that one day non-Jews, Italians, Greeks, Koreans, everybody was going to worship together the God of Israel. But you see, even though Jesus had said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, they read it through their own prejudices. They thought that Jesus said, or that he meant that they should just go and preach to all the Jewish people that they found everywhere. You know, we can do that to the word of God sometimes, right? We see what's there on the page in black and white, but... Sometimes we read it not the way Jesus said it, but we, we read it the way that we think he ought to have said it. And because of that, they missed the meaning of the Great Commission. They thought people needed to come in through the gate of the law of Moses before they could even meet Jesus first. But Jesus said, no, I am the door. So Peter went up on his housetop. He went up onto his roof. It was common then to go up onto the roof to relax or to get a little escape from the heat. Some of you that are of a certain age can remember uh, the days before we had uh, air conditioners everywhere. You know, nowadays you can get an air conditioner in your hat, right? You know, but back in the day when it was too hot in the summer, you had no air conditioning. You had to go outside on your roof or you had to go out in the fire escape, right? Some people thought Peter fell asleep on the roof, but that's not what the scripture says. I don't know about you, but I usually fall asleep after the big lunch, not before the big lunch. So Peter was not asleep. The scripture says that he fell into a trance. Uh, this is a, a trance, a biblical trance. It does not come about from, you know, staring at your navel and mumbling strange words. In the Bible, a trance is a state in which you interact with the realm of the spirit but are still conscious. It's different from a dream. Uh, in a trance, the spiritual realm is more real to you than the natural world that's around you. And I'm not going to explore in detail the contents of the vision with you that we read, but I want you to see that Peter got the message God was intending to give him. God was saying to Peter that he had made clean what was previously unclean. And Peter understood from that vision that God was now calling Gentiles to salvation as well as calling the Jews. The category of unreachable people had been eliminated by God. And from now on, everyone would become a candidate for salvation. Aren't you glad about that? Amen. But I noticed that Peter had to go up into the place of prayer in order to get that word. 
He had to go and meet God in order for God to meet him. And perhaps, church, we don't always reach the people we want to reach because we seldom give God enough opportunities to give us the insight and to give us the power that we need to reach people. Well, I hope you still love me after I said that. God can't speak to us sometimes when we don't go someplace where he can touch us and where we can hear him. Church, we need to get back up onto our roof, whatever that is for you, whatever your closet or your roof is, and we need to go to the place of prayer and fasting again for people we care about who are far from God. Let me also say as, as kindly as I can that it would help our praying sometimes if we were a little more honest. You know, it's good to be honest in our praying and it's okay to admit to yourself that someone has wandered away from God. This is for somebody today. Sometimes we don't want to admit to ourselves that people are actually in the condition that they're in. Pastors hear this kind of comment a lot, you know. Well, Pastor Nick, I know he steals from me, and I know he takes crack, and I know he hangs out with criminals, but he has a really good heart. <laughs> people say things like that. Church, listen, hear me today. If you hear nothing else, denying reality does not change reality. But once I can admit that Junior isn't right with God, I can get him some help. Once I can admit that Junior isn't right with God, I can go up on my roof and I can ask God to touch him and ask God to give me some strategy and some power to be able to reach him and see his life transformed by the power of Christ. Church, let's go up again on our roof and let's pray and let's see what God will say to us about the unreachable ones. Okay, the next thing to do to follow the Spirit, if you still like me, is this. Don't stay on your roof. Come down and make an unlikely friend. Don't stay on your roof. Come down and make an unlikely friend. You know, this is something that can be just as hard on us as the first part. Peter not only went up on his roof, but he also came down and he made some new friends that he did certainly not expect to make that day. Peter took them into his house although I'm sure he considered them to be unclean people. It was going to be good preparation for his first trip to the actual house of unclean people. Some of us don't ever really go up on the roof and get strategy and power from God to deal with people, but some of us, you know, actually like being on the roof. We like it a lot. In fact, we stay up on the roof all the time. We can stay up there so much that we don't ever come down from the roof and get to know the people who are knocking on our door. Hmm. That's good preaching right there, as somebody once said. But just like in the case of Peter, did you know that there are people out there who've been told that you have something they need? The word outreach is made up of two smaller words, reach and out. You have to reach somebody, and in order to do that, you're going to have to go out. You're going to have to come down off your roof, and you're going to have to go out and meet them. Peter heard the Spirit's voice, but I want to tell you today that the voice of the Spirit doesn't just come to bring you strategy and to bring you tactics about how to reach the unreachable. Sometimes the voice of the Spirit tells us to go down and get our hands dirty. Peter. I sent some Italians to take you for a little ride. Don't be afraid. <laughs> See, the funny thing is that meant the same thing in 40 AD as it means today. It's kind of funny. <laughs> but it's okay. I'm Italian. I can make that joke. You know how that works. It's an Italian thing. You wouldn't understand. Now, where the Spirit is sending you is something that you have to figure out with Him, and it will probably be different from everyone. Your call is not your call, but all our calls are a little different from each other. But let's make sure that we're listening to His voice so we know where He is sending us. Peter had a vision, but now he also had the voice of the Spirit, a very scary word that was telling him to go to the house 
of a centurion, of all things. He had to be ready. Listen, he had to be ready to move from the place of prayer to the place of involvement. And that's a big shift sometimes. We need to make that shift ourselves. The third thing we need to do to follow the Spirit is this. Leave the neighborhood. Go see what God is up to. Leave the neighborhood. Go see what God is up to. It's hard to imagine what Peter must have been thinking as he started walking to the house of Cornelius. It was probably the scariest trip that he'd ever taken. Reaching out to Gentiles was, was going to require Peter to enter into the world of the hated Romans, and not just any Romans. These were not Roman merchants or farmers. These were Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers were in the business of enforcing the laws of Caesar. They crucified people. And on more than one occasion, they had deliberately defiled the temple of Israel's God. And you know, there were certainly Jewish people who would have considered Peter to be a traitor to his fellow Jews simply by virtue of the fact that he was going to the house of the Romans to meet with them. Once he got to Cornelius' house, Peter was going to have to deal with strange-looking faces, strange accents, and strange, unfamiliar smells. In the same way, we may be called upon by the Lord to leave aside what's comfortable for us and seize opportunities that God is showing us, even if they will take us to places that we don't want to go. We need to look for the signs of grace, though. We need to be encouraged by what God is already doing in people who are unlikely people. And just like Peter did, we need to be looking for the devout Romans who have come across our paths. Church, we need to look for people who are ready to listen. We need to look for people who are talking about God and wondering about him, asking about him. We need to be alert for people who know already that God has done something for them. Amen. Look for people who appreciate the fact that you have a relationship with God. My wife and I have a friend who says that he, he knows we have a direct line to the big guy. That may not be the way that you feel comfortable speaking about the Almighty, but you know what? Don't take offense at that. When people say that kind of thing to you, you use that as a springboard to start a conversation that can help them get their own direct line Amen. to the Almighty. Amen. And let's take advantage of God's timing when it presents itself to us in an obvious way like that. Listen, you know, we can't always have God's perfect timing, but I think we can see if we're paying attention when God actually is moving. Three things we need to do to reach people who can't be reached. Get rid of your list of unreachable people. Follow the Holy Spirit into unfamiliar territory. And the last one is this. Deliver the message of welcoming grace. Deliver the message of welcoming grace. You know, Luke and the Holy Spirit were a great author team. And I love the anticipation that is built into this story. I love how the anticipation level rises and you want to see what's going to happen. And the anticipation rises. And finally, at the end of the chapter, the Italian band gets baptized in the spirit. And that proved that God had accepted them. Now, Peter was wise to bring them a word of welcoming grace, even though he might have doubted what was going to happen when he started sharing it. You can imagine as Peter walked in the door, he was probably thinking something that we've all thought a few times, what in the world am I doing here? But he shared anyway. In church, let me help somebody today. We are not responsible for the final, ultimate outcome of other people's lives. We are called to faithfully, yes, we're called to faithfully sow the seed of the word. We are called to water those seeds with our prayers. And we're called to give those seeds warmth and light by showing people the love of God. But hear me, only God can give the increase of that seed. 
And it's only sometimes, it's only occasionally that you might have the blessing of being the one who's there when that seed is reaped for the kingdom of God. But you know what? Sow that seed anyway. Sow it anyway. Bring the message of God's welcoming grace. There were three important parts that make that up in Peter's message as I begin to close. First, I see that Peter brought a message of peace, a message of peace. In verse 36, Peter says, The gospel is the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. It's a message of peace. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned. Everyone has turned aside to his own way. But the Lord has laid upon him, upon Jesus, the iniquity or the sin of us all. And God is offering you a deal today. You can pay the penalty for your sins all by yourself and stay miserable. Or you can accept the sacrifice of Jesus in your place because he took the punishment for your sins. And then you can have peace with God. And God says to you today, deal or no deal. Christians, we need to bring people the good news that people can have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is a savior from hell and a savior from separation from God because he's a savior from sin. He saves us from the things that separate us from God and have created a state of war with God. God wants to blow that all away and come into a state of peace with you. Second, I see that Peter brought a message of deliverance, not only a message of peace, but a message of God's delivering power. And in verse 38, Peter talks about how Jesus healed people and delivered people through God's power. He says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit in power, and he went around doing good and healing everybody who was oppressed by the devil because God was with him. And church, we need to tell people that Jesus not only saves you from your sin, but Jesus heals the sick and he delivers the captives. We need to proclaim the power of the risen living Christ. He is not a self-help program. Jesus is not a philosophy. I don't know if anybody other than Pastor Glenn was convinced of that, but I want you to know that Jesus is the son of righteousness risen with healing in his wings today. Jesus still heals people. He still sets the captives free, and he can still touch and heal the mind of that person you know whose mind has been fried by drugs. If you need to be set free from drugs or if you need to be set free today from bondage to the occult, then come to Jesus today. He can set you free. Finally, I see that Peter brought to his Roman audience a message of hope. A message of hope Peter brought to everyone in that room. In verse 43, Peter said, To him all the prophets give witness that through his name, Whoever, everybody say whoever. whoever, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins, meaning that their sins will be sent away. Now, I know sometimes as Christians, we hear people talking about my sins being covered and so forth. And I understand what people are getting at when they say their sins have been covered. But, you know, if your sins have been covered, they're still under there. They're just covered. But in Christ Jesus, your sins are not just covered. They are sent away. They are gone. And that's good news. Peter brought a message of hope for whoever. Church, please hear me today. Make sure that your gospel, make sure that your presentation of Jesus to people is a gospel of hope. Make sure that your gospel doesn't build bigger fences or put additional fences in front of people who want to enter into the kingdom of God. This crowd of Romans, this crowd of Gentiles at Cornelius' house was quiet. They were holding their breath as Peter began to speak. There was a funny thing about Peter's message. 
right up until the end, I don't know if you noticed it when we read it, but right up until the end, Peter's message still seemed to be centered on Israel. And I think Cornelius and his friends were wondering if there was really anything in it for them. I don't know if you noticed, but Peter started out by saying, this is a word that God sent to Israel. Then Peter said, well, it started out in Galilee, and then it was proclaimed throughout Judea, the land of the Jews. Then he said, God has commanded us to preach to the people. Now, when a Jewish person like Peter said the people, he didn't mean all the people. He meant the people. He meant God sent us to preach this message to Jews. That's not very hopeful so far. Cornelius was a centurion, and so that meant he probably had some good education, probably a lot more education than the men whom he commanded. And so it's quite possible that Cornelius himself knew enough about Jesus to know that even Jesus had said, I have not been sent except to the lost sheep of where? The house of Israel. So Cornelius and his friends had to be wondering as they listened to Peter's sermonette. I hear a lot of good news here, but I wonder if any of this good news actually applies to me. Oh, but then Peter said a wonderful thing. Peter said, whoever. Peter said, whoever believes, whoever believes in Jesus will receive remission of sins. At that moment, when they heard that the good news of Jesus was for whoever, something happened. Faith came alive in their spirits. The Bible says when they heard those words, what words? The whoever words. Because it's not until Peter got to that part of his little message and said, whoever believes in Jesus, that the Bible says when he said that, the Holy Spirit fell on them. They began to speak with tongues and they began to praise the God of Israel. Christians, make sure that your message, make sure that your gospel is a gospel of hope, a message of salvation that throws the doors wide open to anyone who wants to come and meet Jesus. I'm so glad that Jesus said, if any man thirsts, any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And Jesus is still saying to people today, behold, I make all things, I can make all people new. Let me speak a word to people who may be wondering here today if God will really receive them. You know, one thing that keeps us from coming to God is shame. And shame is a powerful thing. Shame is what drove Adam to hide in the bushes after he had literally walked with God in glory every day. You may be here today like Cornelius, hearing what Jesus has done for others, but maybe not quite convinced that Jesus will do something for you. But you know, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, he said, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There may be some people here this morning who feel so broken or feel so guilty that they don't think God could ever receive them. But you're wrong because the Bible says, though your sins be as scarlet, they will be made as white as snow. Don't give in to the power of that shame today that's trying to keep you from coming to God. God says, come to me and I will welcome you and you will be sons and daughters to me and I will be a father to you. There are men who feel that God can't accept them because they've committed certain sins or they're trapped in certain things. There are women here too who feel that no one would ever, no one could ever accept them if people knew what they had done. Some people say, oh, if people really knew the real me, they wouldn't want me around, they wouldn't love me. But you know what? God loves you and he's the one who knows you better than anybody. God's the one who sees everything you've ever done, good or bad. And he's saying to you, I have loved you with an everlasting love. He says to you again today, come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. 
His message, the message of Jesus, is a gospel of peace. It's a gospel of God's delivering power. And it's a message of hope as well. In just a few moments, we're going to pray together. And we're going to give you an opportunity to pray and receive God's forgiveness and receive new life from Jesus Christ. How can we reach people, church? How can we reach people who can't be reached? First, throw away your list of unreachable people. And then be willing to follow the Holy Spirit into unfamiliar territory. And then make sure that you are bringing people a message of God's welcoming grace. He didn't put up a fence in front of you. That he welcomed you. That he tore down every fence. Not just the fence between Jew and Gentile, but the fence between you and God. It was taken down by the blood of his cross. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me, Lord. If you heard what I said this morning about the Lord welcoming you, breaking the power of that shame and enabling you to come to God and be accepted and be received by him, we're going to pray right now. We're going to give you an opportunity to invite Jesus to be your Lord and to be the captain, to be the leader of your life. I'm going to pray a prayer, and I want to ask everyone if they'll pray along with me, and I hope you'll pray this from your heart. I hope you'll respond to the Holy Spirit who's tugging at your heart right now and encouraging you to follow Jesus and be received by God. Come on, would you pray this with me? Say, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask you to forgive all my sins. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose again to set me free. Today I call you Lord. Come into my heart. Wash me and make me clean. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me that living water. Make me a new creation. Set me free today, Lord. And break every chain in my life. I give you my heart now. Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you prayed that prayer with us for the first time today, then congratulations are in order. And right after we conclude our service and prayer in just a few moments, I want to invite you to come if you prayed that way today for the first time. There's some folks here who want to meet you. We're going to pray with you. And we have some materials also that we want to give you that will help you get started in walking out a new life with Jesus Christ. And we want to pray for everybody else right now. How many of you want to just take a moment and let's just pray that God will help us to reach some people that maybe we used to think were unreachable. Let's pray together. Come on. Bow your hearts before the Lord and let's pray. Father, right now we come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord. And in Jesus' name, we throw away our list. I just want you to just take your hand, just crumple up that list in your hand just as a sign and just throw it away. Lord, we just throw away right now that list of unreachable people. Lord, we ask you to forgive us, Lord, for making it harder than it really is. Lord, forgive us. Maybe we stop sharing with some people out of prejudice, Lord, out of a lack of faith. Maybe they were unkind to us. Maybe they rejected us when we spoke to them, Lord. But Father, we're gonna try again. We're gonna launch out again. Father, because we refuse to see people as being unreachable. Father, I pray that you'd help each one of us in this room to follow the Holy Spirit. Lord, along this line that Peter did, Lord, help us to go back into that place of prayer, Lord, to get new vision, to get a vision for a bigger harvest, Lord God, to get strategy for reaching people. Help us, God, to even get down from the place of prayer when we have to and go to the place of involvement in people's lives. Father, even if it means going and traveling with some Romans and going to the house of some Romans to some unfamiliar places, Lord, give us the grace and give us the courage to reach out even to people who are not like we are, Father. Father, I ask you that you'd work on our gospel, Lord. Lord, the message that we're bringing to people. God, help us. Help us to be sure that it's a message of peace, that it's a message of deliverance. Lord, help us to not be afraid to tell people that Jesus can not only save them, but heal them, Lord. And Father, help us to bring a word of hope, God, 
God forbid, Lord, that we should ever put up more fences in front of people who would want to enter your kingdom. Father, I pray that you would use me. I pray that you would use us to reach the people, God, that we used to think were unreachable. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's sing that again. Lord, I give you my heart today.